are listening to Beyond the Whistle. Beyond the Whistle is the show that takes you beyond the X's and O's to provide tips and advice on the business of sports and how sports professionals can advance in their careers. Beyond the Whistle is brought to you by McCant Sports, a sports executive search and sports leadership consulting firm. Learn more at McCantSports.com. You're listening to Beyond the Whistle. I'm your host, Odell McCants, and thank you for listening. I have to admit, I was planning to release this episode, my interview with Michael Cross, earlier in November as we were entering the early signing period for basketball and other sports. But I also think it's really relevant now as we're entering December and the very first early signing period for college football. And my guest, Michael Cross, has great insight on the recruiting process and the uh, signing process and national letter of intent process. And I'm really excited to share this with you. You can learn more uh, about Michael at his blog, Ultimate Sports Insider, which there is a link to in the show notes. And here's my interview with Michael Cross. I'm really excited to have as my guest today, Michael Cross. Michael is Assistant Athletic Director of New Business Development at Penn State University. In addition to being responsible for identifying new revenue and generating partnerships for the athletic department, Michael also serves as sports administrator for Penn State's men's and women's hockey and tennis teams. Prior to Penn State, Michael served for five years as athletic director at Bradley University of the Missouri Valley Conference. Showing his great ability for closing deals at Bradley, Michael signed the school's first ever all sports apparel deal with Adidas and negotiated a multimedia rights deal with Nelligan Sports, now a part of Learfield Sports. And if his roles at Penn State don't keep him busy enough, Michael is the founder of AthleteViewpoint.com, which we'll get into deeper, and is, po- is a popular speaker and blogger on trends in recruiting and understanding the feedback your athletes are giving you. Michael, welcome to Beyond the Whistle. Thanks, Odell. Great to be here and talk with you. Michael, you really caught my attention what you have uh, written on your blog and uh, some other podcasts I've heard of, about the whole concept of the National Signing Day and the National Letter of Intent process. And as we're recording this, we're coming up on about a week, week and a half out from the November 8, 2017 uh, fall uh, signing period. And can you give us an overview of kind of uh, what this process is and, and how it has evolved? Sure. In its simplest form, the uh, National Letter of Intent Signing Day is the day where both the institution and the prospective student athlete make official what their intentions are regarding a prospective student enrolling in a particular school, uh, the type of financial aid they'll receive, uh, all those types of things. Uh, and, and when this process first began, it would be a process that was pretty closely aligned with a very, what I would call, short recruiting time frame. You know, recruiting was happening in the, the senior and perhaps maybe the junior year of high school. Uh, and the, the signing date was really, um, you know, a formal conclusion to the recruiting process. What's happened as time has gone by with the recruiting process moving earlier and earlier to the stage where it's very common for individuals to, um, you know, to commit to institutions as a freshman or a sophomore in high school, uh, it, it's really created some very interesting dynamics where commitments really aren't the commitments but their intentions. Uh, and you've got people, you know, declaring those intentions three and four years out. Uh, perhaps even and in further into the future, uh, relative to when they actually might enroll in college. So it creates a whole host of dynamics, and I think when you tie that piece in with uh, the incredible way social media has, has really changed the recruiting environment, the way people are trying to create workarounds as it relates to communication between prospects who are not yet recruitable age and college and university campuses, uh, it, it creates some really strange brew as it relates to what signing day looks like, and it takes on a far more circus-like atmosphere than it once did in ways that aren't always a great fit for what college and university attendance should be about. Yeah, you, Michael, you mentioned something that really st- stood out to me there, commitment versus intention, uh, intent. And uh, many of my listeners are, are, are coaches themselves. When you're working with athletes and, and, and coaches, um, how do how do you suggest, or how how can how can coaches go about in their recruiting process, weeding out or identifying what truly is a commitment or 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 a person's or an athlete's intention? 
Well, you know, that's the, that's the purpose of signing day. You know, much like any type of arrangement that you would make in any type of, of transaction, whether it's buying a car, buying a house, um, you know, whatever it might be, the, the transaction isn't completed until you sit down and sign the paperwork. So while I think, and I'd like to think, you know, many, many people go into these processes as, as honest in their intentions um, and very forthright in their thinking and their approach uh, and act with integrity, uh, the challenge you get is that there's a lot of different pieces that can change. Families, uh, you know, may see one opportunity uh, that makes sense to them, but the prospective student athletes' uh, skill level changes and they find another opportunity more enticing. You know, that student athlete's um, interest from an academic major standpoint could change. There could be a coaching change. Uh, there's a whole variety of factors that can relate to reasons why. Uh, you know, what, what is the commitment really isn't one until there's a signed document indicating that everybody is in agreement of here's, here's when you'll enroll, here's what the financial aid offer is behind that enrollment, and ultimately the institution can't even comment about the situation until the prospect signs that agreement. So all those factors really, you know, are what make the, the description of a commitment to be a misnomer, um, it, it's 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 an intention. It's a, could be a strong intention, could be an extremely strong intention, but commitment prov- um, really implies permanence. And you know, I think the the reality is that, and you can see this in in all kinds of blogs and different people that write out there, is that uh, these commitments change all the time for a variety of reasons, and ultimately leave people in awkward situations and circumstances because they're all trying to make um, uh, the best decisions they can. And obviously, as more time passes, you have more information that can help inform better decision making. Good decision making doesn't happen with uh, recruiting freshmen in high school. Uh, Much better decision making can happen when recruiting juniors and seniors in high school. Uh, So uh, that's why I like that phrase of intention more than commitment. But uh, for a variety of reasons, people prefer the word commitment uh, because it feels more secure, even though it doesn't, it's probably masking what the reality is behind it. I think that's why we see, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to pick on, on high school football here for a minute, but it seems to be more so than other sports in, in my, in my perception is that you see these football commitments where they will commit but they'll still go on their visits. And of course, coach says or is thinking, well, okay, then I'm going to continue to recruit because I don't want to be left holding the bag come signing day. And you sign, you've signed with someone else, even though you've had this given to us, us this commitment. Sure. And, and so what, you know, there's a lot of things that people will do to defend against that. They will, they will oversign, they will, they will sign more individuals or commit more individuals than they have available scholarships with the expectation that, uh, somebody will ultimately not materialize in the way they thought they would. They they may decide to go somewhere else. They don't sign at all. They don't meet the grade expectations necessary to be a qualifier or to be admitted to the institution. Uh, so it's a, it's an inexact science, and and you know everybody likes to have uh, you know a lot of clarity and a lot of exactness in what they're doing. But really, this is is very far from an exact process. And you're, you know, you're dealing with people. You're dealing with, uh, with people who change their mind, uh, people who have different goals, and people who are, you know, young people who are evolving in their view about what's best for them and what their family thinks is best for them in a way that really leaves uh, things a lot less than the, the certainty that uh, I think most people think surrounds the recruiting process. So if we did focus on the transaction, if you will, and we... you. Student athlete and his or her parents uh, come to a point where they've decided on uh, what's the best uh, school for them, and likewise, that coach and coaching staff they've decided that this this is the best athlete for them and 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 what they have available in their roster. Uh, what do you think it would look like if we were just able to consummate the deal right right at right at that moment and not wait on November eighth? Well, it's a, it's a great question. So I actually wrote about this in my blog, ultimatesportsinsider.com, and got, got 
quite a bit into the details of this. And, and what I would say as a starting point is, uh, you know, a lot of what we're dealing with is very imaginary and very arbitrary. So when you think about NCAA recruiting rules and signing dates, for whatever reason, there's something magical about November 8th or the idea that you could recruit a, you know, you can start recruiting conversations with somebody after, you know, July 1st of their junior year or January 1st of their junior year or June 15th after their sophomore year. Like, those are very made up dates that don't align with everybody's situation. And so what I've said for a while now is, uh, you know, every prospect is in a different place. Every prospect in terms of their maturity level, uh, both academically and athletically, uh, comes to these points of having to make decisions in very different places. And and we're really trying to, to have a one-size-fits-all arrangement as opposed to one that works well for each individual case. And you know, which is what creates a lot of the ambiguity and a lot of the uncertainty that's out there in the process and a lot of the, of the, the less than, than clear understanding about what commitment means versus intention and other things. So, you know, I would, I would certainly advocate for an arrangement where, uh, at a minimum, the conversations that are happening can be direct between the prospect and the institution and the head coach or the assistant coach that's recruiting the individual. And, and really where I came to this conclusion was in working with, with one of our teams uh, recently, they had a uh, prospect who was on campus for an unofficial visit. And while that individual was here for an unofficial visit, they were uh, you know, at a, a local hotel, probably about a mile from our athletic department. And you know, our coach who wanted to change a meeting location had to call the uh, prospects high school coach or, or AAU coach, I can't remember which, but call the prospects you know, coach, who then had to call the prospect and then the prospect had to call our coach in order to communicate where the changed um, visit should be happening. I mean, just an absurd <laughs> array of, of circumstances to say, hey, we're going to meet you at a different time or a different place. Absolutely. But those are the workarounds that we've created uh, in really bizarre ways in an era, and they're, and they're hold, hold, holdovers from another, another era, but really the, we're, a, we're a constant communication society at this point. Mm-hmm. Every single thing that, that people do is talked about and, and publicly broadcast in all sorts of social media, all sorts of uh, electronic format. And for some reason, we continue to hang on to this idea that if, if as long as we don't let somebody start having a conversation prior to a, a, an arbitrary date, that all is going to be well in the world. And, and it's very apparent that for now 30 plus years, this arrangement has not worked. Uh, the, the tinkering with the dates, moving them back and forth, shifting them around really just does not achieve what people are trying to achieve. And so now we start you know, running afoul of NCAA rules, even though they're really arbitrary to begin with. So the intention is good behind it. The practical application of what's happening is is really, um, really just a mess. And moving in a direction that would allow freer conversation, uh, better clarity in the in the communication and, and better clarity in the transaction and ultimately getting to the finish line of the transaction, uh, I think would benefit a lot of people for sure. Michael, does the college's admissions calendar have could could that possibly uh, have have a place in in possibly uh, reforming this 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 process? It could and it should, uh, but I think in in some cases the reality is that it doesn't. Um, and what I mean by that is that the the recruiting process and and what goes on there as it relates to the admissions calendar. Uh, is different at every institution. There are institutions out there that are admitting, you know, let's say 15 to 20 percent of the people who ultimately apply to that institution. They're highly selective. Uh, It's very difficult to get admitted to those institutions. And those institutions, from an admission standpoint, uh, really want to make sure that they are uh, you know, getting as much information as possible before making that decision to admit somebody. Simultaneously, there are other institutions that are much more uh, toward the end of less selectivity, and it could be in situations where they accept, you know, let's say, 70, 80, you know, plus percent of the individuals who apply. 
there's lots of different institutional missions that can inform that type of arrangement. So those types of things all matter. And then the last piece is that different institutions rely on enrollment management in very different ways. There are schools that are, are heavily reliant on the ability to enroll a, a class. And so if they've got somebody who is admissible, they're in a situation where they may want to act very, very early to give that, that prospect or that prospective student or prospective student athlete an indication as to whether or not they're going to be admitted. And hopefully that early admission or that early decision might lead them to commit to that institution and help with their overall institutional financial health, but not every institution is like that. So uh, the admissions calendar is, is a, a factor that could potentially be helpful, but because there's such differences between the admission policies and the approaches of various institutions, uh, it's probably not the perfect solution that some might look to and think that that's going to be the, the way that gets solved. If we were to eliminate the signing date, how would you see that impacting coaches and their actually and their, and their actual recruiting and evaluation process? Uh, great question. So the the first thing I would say is that in some ways we have this already. I mean, when you get to, for example, in the sport of basketball, when you get to the spring signing period, that spring signing period is is essentially open ended. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you, you reach that date and then after that date, you know, you'll sign an NLI or if, or if it reaches, I think, past a certain point, you then just sign a financial aid agreement to enroll at the institution. But, you know, that, that's a very, that's a very open-ended process, you know, and, and the, the, the recruiting signing process really turns on and off. I think the one benefit of having a date that I can see is that it allows, um, everybody to have a pause, if you will, or at least have some time to reflect and to avoid really high pressure sales as it relates to somebody committing to an institution. So what you don't want to have is a situation where a prospect goes on a visit or is really enamored with the situation and and you've got somebody who uh, really just leans on the person and says, hey, look, I got to have you sign right now or within the next 24 hours or your your deal is gone. Mm-hmm. You know, that exists now as it is. And But there's there's this escape, which is the, the intention versus commitment that happens on the verbal side of the equation. So, and that's why you see all these changes happening all the time. If you were in an arrangement where you could sign immediately, I think you'd create a dynamic very quickly where people would say, hey, look, you've got 48 hours to decide uh, and then I got to move on to somebody else. But that's already happening anyway. That, like I said, that's happening during the late signing period in, in many sports, and you know people seem to be accepting of it. So um, I don't think you should be able to sign on the spot. I don't think you should be able to sign in person with a coach. But uh, I also don't know that you should have to wait, uh, you know, eighteen months to two years to sign that commitment either in a way that creates a lot of the lack of clarity that exists out there in the recruiting landscape. Yeah. And I I feel like it would give coaches some pause there to really uh, do some deeper evaluations prior to, uh, prior to, to giving offers. Um, If they know that we we could sign this, you know, (laughs) now or in a week, uh, we really need to do maybe a deeper understanding of, of who the prospect is, not just as an athlete, but uh, character evaluations, just some deeper evaluations to, to really uh, identify a true fit for their for their program. Well, I, I agree with it in concept, but there's there's things that the NCAA has put in place that that prevent that from from right out of the gate. I mean, I think you've got seven recruiting opportunities of contacts and evaluations. So, yeah. you know, to again, I don't know what's magical about seven. Uh, why that number was chosen, but you, you've got a, you know, you've already got some governors in place that restrict the ability of coaches to do some of the types of things you're talking about. So, you know, you can only watch them play so many times. You can only create so many opportunities for evaluation and for contact. And that's why, you know, some of these, these, you know, massive recruiting uh, events that you see, whether it's, you know, summer basketball or honestly, this happens across pretty much every sport at this point exist because you've only got so many opportunities to evaluate. It's one stop shopping and, and you're going in and trying to make a judgment based on what you see somebody do in the course of a three day weekend. Uh, mm-hmm. And then you get a few more conversations, watch a little more film. 
uh, you know, you're making some really major decisions in terms of investment in an individual. I mean, if you think about the value of what a college scholarship is, you know, it could be forty, fifty thousand dollars a year. I mean, you're making a, a two hundred, you know, you know, two hundred thousand dollar decision to offer somebody that that level of opportunity based on what can sometimes be a very, very small uh, sample size as to what you're seeing. And um, that's a challenge for sure. But but part of our process is designed to do exactly that, limit the number of opportunities that you have to actually make those evaluations, both academically, athletically, and otherwise. You, you, you've you been a great thought leader on, on this concept. What, what do you see as the temperature for any type of possible reform to the letter of intent and signing process? Uh, I think it's cool. Uh, I think it's, it's very cool. The, the process that you saw with football and the, the angst that was caused around, uh, you know, some of these signing day opportunities that were discussed, uh, I think has put, uh, really dampened the enthusiasm to try and translate this into other sports. Uh, but there's sports that are looking at it. Uh, the lacrosse coaches, to their credit, uh, are experimenting with a uh, a very, uh, um, you know, I guess I would call it a more sane uh, recruiting calendar where, you know, the types of things that we're talking about in terms of early offers and verbal commitments are going to be very, very restricted uh, and moved much later in the process. Uh, there's a working group in the sport of men's hockey that is having discussions about the recruiting environment in that sport. Uh, so there's an awareness of this for sure, uh, but there's so many different constituents and stakeholders uh, in this process, whether it's athletic directors, coaches in specific sports, AAU coaches, the, pr- the prospects and the families themselves, uh, all trying to figure out what is best. Um, and the one thing that I keep coming back to is that the reality is all of these groups want to talk to each other. You know, and the, mm-hmm. the prospects want to talk to the schools. The schools want to talk to the prospects. The schools want to watch the prospects play. The prospects want the schools to watch them play. Uh, but we continue to try and put regulations that prevent the types of things that people want to have happen from actually happening. And so we create these elaborate workarounds, uh, many of which bring all kinds of outside influences into our sports uh, and third-party intermediaries that really do a disservice to the clear, direct, honest, specific communication between two parties that's now handled by somebody else and can hamper and hinder the, the relationship building that would be, I think, a good... Uh, a good way to enhance the recruiting process and ultimately bring some better clarity uh, to what's going on. So, Michael, so we get to November 8th and a student athlete signs with uh, State U and we uh, fast forward to uh, that fall of 2018 and they're on campus and and they're attending classes and, and participating in that sport. Can you share with us what you're doing um, to uh, to help uh, to help schools get an understanding of, of of the experience that their athletes are having and how they can improve the experience and the relationships on, on campus? Sure. So you're you're drifting into uh, you know the work that I'm I'm doing with the company that I founded or co-founded uh, called Athlete Viewpoint, and Athlete Viewpoint is really. Uh, in its most basic form, an opportunity for athletic departments to outsource their student-athlete survey process to somebody uh, in a company that's that's got uh, a lot of experience in the college sports landscape who is willing to invest uh, the time and the understanding as it relates to research methodology, questionnaire design, all those types of things to build you know, a customized survey for your campus that then can be used to gather information about every aspect of the student athlete's experience uh, and simultaneously allow you to compare the data at your institution, both within your institution. So for example, you know, compare a football coach to the other coaches at your school or to compare your, uh, your football coach or some aspect of your department to the other schools that are part of the platform in a way that hopefully brings greater clarity about, uh, you know, taking the information that you're getting from your athletes and putting it in some type of context, either your institutional context or a national context, so that you've got better clarity about just how certain aspects of your department are performing. 
Well, Michael, thank you very much for your time. And we're going to have links in the show notes to Michael's blog, uh, Ultimate Sports Insider, as well as Athlete Viewpoint. And I want to thank you very much for your time and being a guest today on uh, Beyond the Whistle. You're welcome, Odell. I've enjoyed the conversation and uh, appreciate the opportunity to talk.